Documentary filmmakers take us into the lives of their subjects in a way that the written word simply can't. We see what they see. We get a sense of the physical space they occupy with our own eyes. We hear their voices. Today's guest weaves these elements together in powerful films that explore everything from love to addiction. She's Elaine McMillian Sheldon, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week, we're joined by award-winning filmmaker Elaine McMillian Sheldon. Elaine, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So you have a tremendous body of work for a filmmaker so young. Uh, so we want to really talk a little bit about uh, all of it, but let's start with My Love, Six Stories of True Love, which is a remarkable series on Netflix. Uh, tell us about the episode that you made. Yeah, so there are uh, six episodes, India, Brazil, Spain, uh, where am I forgetting? South Korea, Japan, and America. So I did the American episode. I featured a couple that's been together for more than 60 years in Vermont. They ran a farm. They had 100 um, milk cows, dairy cows at one point, and now are retired and their son runs the farm. And so we really just observed their life over the course of one year. We spent a week a month filming with them, just going about their daily life, but also their preparations for the end of life. Uh, so their cremation plans and the where they plan to be buried and all those types of things. So um, it was a really, it's like actually a kind of coming out at a great time with COVID uh, and people feeling very isolated. It's a very uplifting series. It's very heartwarming to see all these couples across the world expressing their love after 40 plus years of marriage, all of them. Yeah. Uh, when, when you, when you make a film like that, uh, and you sort of, you sort of fly on the wall, how do you, um, how do you do that? How do you, how do you sort of blend, it seems seamlessly, uh, into their lives? Well, magic's in the editing, so editing out all the <laughs> awkwardness because uh, there's more awkward moments than not. Uh, but you kind of have to set the rules early on and make sure that people understand that th that you're there not to interview them, but you're there to observe. And it's about time. You know, the more time you spend around people, the easier it is for them to start ignoring you and more comfortable they are with you in scenes that maybe are tougher and, you know, filming scenes at bedtime, you know, when they're getting ready to go to sleep, those are all like conversations you have to have with people and gauge they're comfortable if they're comfortable and how they want it shot. And so it's really a relationship that you build over the course of time. And as that time progresses through the year, you get more access to more moments that feel intimate. And so it's about showing up over and over and keeping your word and uh, making sure to not break the trust that's been built between you two. Do you have an estimate of how many hours you actually spent with them, both with with cameras rolling and just getting to know them and background stuff and talking to them? Any any idea? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, we would film a full week every month, so seven days a month for twelve months, and most of the days would be. I would say we probably would get around four to five hours of footage a day. And then the rest of the hours that we spent together were off camera. Uh, Ginger always would bake us some baked goods. Um, uh, we would go on hikes with them, just spending time getting to know each other. And that it's the time off camera, building the relationship that allows the on camera moments to really happen because at that point we're kind of like family around them. So I, I don't know, I mean, five hours a day for a week, 12 times a year. So there's a lot of footage to go through. <laughs> How did you find this couple? I I know the backstory there, but maybe you can tell us. It's really sort of a remarkable story in and of itself. Yeah, well, it seems like a needle in the haystack type of assignment when it was given to me to find a couple and and to not be given any constraints. They just had to be in America. And, and we thought that we wanted a rural couple. And so at first we were looking across the Southwest and the South, and Louisiana and Texas and New Mexico and elsewhere. And I actually did a road trip and met a bunch of couples in person, but before that could even happen, it was my co-producer or my associate producer Molly and I 
hitting the phones of calling upwards of 300 people from nonprofits to volunteer organizations to senior centers to people that just have access to um, a community that are still, we were always asking for a couple that um, was still very active in their community. That's something we were really looking for, someone that wasn't isolated and some and some people that still really shared a bond that you could see because this is a film, you want to see them express their love. So it can't just be, you know, any couple that's, uh, they have to be comfortable with hugging and kissing and holding hands in public and all those sorts of things. And so um, it's a, it was a, it was a long journey and it was actually pretty discouraging at times because <laughs> there was just so many people and, um, at, at, it's crazy because we went on this nationwide search of, and what happened is this couple actually was recommended at the end of that through an internal recommendation from Boardwalk Pictures, which is who produced the show for Netflix. And so we ended up finding the couple from the associate producer that was at Boardwalk because her sister was their neighbor. And uh, so, but it took, it actually took, I think, meeting all those couples and talking to all those organizations to really learn what we really wanted in, in the couple. And so when we did finally come across Ginger and David, it just felt right. And we, they were interested, luckily, so. I can't, I, I can't recommend this movie uh, enough. I came across it just Netflix surfing and was drawn in from, from the, the opening scenes. Uh, but I wanted to get your take they are so candid these are older people so candid talking about dying and death preparations was that difficult for them was that difficult for you how, how did that come to be because that was among the most powerful uh, aspects of, of the film it was one of the things that really attracted me to ginger especially and david is that they had such a um humbleness humility and such a grasp on their stage of life and what they were doing in preparation to save their kids pain and save their kids trouble and i just i you know even within my own family and families that i've known forever we just don't talk about this we don't talk about end of life we don't talk about death and and because of that when it happens sometimes it, it causes more pain and so i just really appreciated their um soberness around it you know recognizing that they had had this full life and celebrating that full 60 years together we we followed them on their 60th year together but also recognizing this is going to come to an end and also finding it interesting that ginger actually wanted to be um buried with her parents not with david and david wanted to be buried on the farm which is something very interesting so there was a lot of surprises about the way they handled the conversation around death and i found it re very refreshing um i've not really met people that have had that grasp and i think it's because they've had very fulfilled lives um and they they just are okay with their situation do do when you're making a film like this i'm not asking if you if you script the conversations but do you say to them so we need you to have this conversation whatever it's going to be is 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 there that kind of planning that goes into it or is it really sort of let's just roll the camera on them and see what happens it is much more of rolling the camera but it's about being at the right conversation so there's a bunch of conversations that happen that we won't film or we'll stop filming midway because it's clear that the material is not something that is really relevant to the scope of the film and so we just have to make sure we're there when they go to the insurance company to talk about uh, the life insurance, right? Because we know what that conversation is going to be, but we don't interrupt during those scenes, you know, in the cremation meeting, we don't interrupt during those scenes. It's it's funny being a documentary filmmaker, you always have this idea of what the scene's going to be and what might be said. And sometimes you're disappointed. Sometimes it's not exactly what you think it's going to be. But majority of the time, you're actually quite surprised that things happen and, and, and life happens that you couldn't have expected. And it's actually more beautiful or more surprising or more ironic than you could have even scripted. So yeah, no script. It's it's just long shots. You know, some of those meetings are an hour long and they take place there four minutes or two minutes in the film. So um, it's a matter of just sort of like condensing things. And there will be moments, you know, where we might prompt them to um, like at the county fair, we wanted them to play a game. Um, and so we went and found the game that had the best framing with the stuffed animals. And we talked to the lady beforehand who was running it and said, this couple's coming over. You don't have to talk to them or anything, but just let, you know, we're going to film this if that's okay with you. And so we will do things like that, that are visually things we want to get. But in terms of story, it's about being there and catching it as it goes. Is that your modus operandi for all of your filmmaking? What you just described that process? 
Yeah, it has been that process, that observational um, sort of hands-off fly on the wall. That has been my process for basically the past 10 years. So you've done two films, two great films uh, about the opioid crisis, and we're going to talk about both of them, and we're going to listen and see a snippet from one of them. But start with Recovery Boys. How, first of all, how did you get interested in the opioid crisis? And then tell us about Recovery Boys, which, again, is a great film. Yeah, well... I mean, America has been hit hard by the opioid crisis, and that's certainly true in my own backyard. I've had um, many middle school and high school friends um, lost to addiction um, or be in prison or have lost their children, but are suffering in some way from this. And so I would, my husband and I, when we were working in 2016, we were really looking to find stories of resilience and stories that didn't just show the pain and exploitation around addiction, which is a lot of the stories we were seeing. It's like, a lot of stories we were seeing were hard to watch. It was people shooting up and overdosing and then the cameras move on. And so we really wanted to see, you know, we know people are resilient. We know people can overcome things. So we wanted to see what that actually looked like over the span. So we followed these men in Recovery Boys for 18 months. The first six months they enter a rehab and the last 12 months they're actually readjusting back to life. Important, important filmmaking is certainly in the realm of public service. Uh, your next film, Heroin, was nominated for an Academy Award. It won an Emmy. We're going to have you talk about that in a moment, but let's let's have a let's have a look and a listen to uh, almost a minute from that film. Angel one responding. I'm not really sure what a plateau is going to look like. You know, I see this as a countrywide problem that has the potential to bankrupt the country. You know, we conservatively estimated that Cabell County, and we're talking 96,000 people, spent probably about $100 million in health care costs associated with IV drug use in 2015. That's one small county in one small state. I don't, I can't even fathom what it's going to look like when it plateaus. But I know it will be welcomed. Yes, ma'am, this was an overdose. Um, we're clear returning. Copy one. So tell us about the film, how it came to be, yeah. what, it, what it is, and what we just saw during that uh, nearly minute-long uh, view and listen. Yeah, so when Kern and I were looking for stories of resilience, we often look in the places that are the most descended upon by parachute journalists. And that was Huntington, West Virginia, where, you know, it was every week, it was the BBC or CNN or someone was coming in for one day to tell this story. And we just felt that there was so much more to the story. And so we were able to identify these three women, a fire chief um, who saves people from um, overdoses every day, a drug court judge who actually helps with reforming people, helping them to re-enter society after felonies, and a street missionary who goes out and helps women who are um, trapped in the cycle of addiction and sex work and helps get them into rehab. And so they're all working at different levels of society, and they actually all work with the same people at different points of their life. And I think what these women represent is sort of those unsung heroes across America that get up every day and have a grassroots effort that actually makes an impact. And, you know, this is not national policy coming from the White House. This is actually getting up every single day and doing what you can do in your own backyard. And so I think essentially that's what we need in a crisis like this is, is more women and more men like these women. And um, we followed them over, over the course of a year as well. Um, and the film is just under 40 minutes. And it's um, it's been a powerful film because it has had such reach and impact because of its length. You know, within an hour, we have it available for educational screenings. You can watch it for 40 minutes and have a 20 minute conversation. And it's, it's still touring in prisons and rehabs and it's going everywhere. Medical schools, lots of medical schools. There was a medical school that was studying the impact of empathy. So when the um, students would watch this film, would they treat patients differently than the, the group of students who hadn't watched the film? And um, yeah, so there's been some incredible um, things that have come from that film. I'm really proud of that. You've referred to that as a community driven impact campaign. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious about the, the inspiration for you. What draws you to telling those kinds of stories? 
I mean, I like to tell stories that we know are happening, but maybe we're not getting past the headlines to the heart and soul and the people and staying, you know, a year. I have the luxury of being a documentary filmmaker where I can chart things over a year. You know, most journalists don't have that time being based in a newsroom. And so because of that, I feel a responsibility to attach those long term stories that are showing struggle, but also showing triumph day in, day out to chart those and put those with impact and so generally you know how I work as a filmmaker is I don't really consider myself an activist who's coming up with the solutions but instead I make this piece that then serves the grassroots activism that's already happening so the community driven impact campaign is really about identifying people all around the country and world who are already working on this issue and then making the film available to them to start these hard conversations. So what is it about the power of this kind of storytelling that that does more than the statistics we read from the CDC, and those are important, and the news reports that we see, and many of them are also important. There's something obviously more here, uh, and it's not just the time commitment. Can you talk about that? Is it the emotional connection that you as a filmmaker make to your subjects and the subjects in turn make to your audiences, or what is it? Because again, the power of this is something very, very different than your quote unquote run of the mill, you know, 30 second clip on the evening news while that may be yeah. important. And it, and it, I think it takes all kinds of media, right? If it wasn't for the statistical analysis, I wouldn't know where to go to show up to show the issue, right? So it takes all kinds of reporting to draw attention to this. But I think what's most effective about this form, especially an observational form where it's not interview based, it's really about capturing scenes unfolding is that it's it's as close as we can get to showing reality. And, you know, even though knowing this is a constructed piece, it's very difficult, you know, when you're a filmmaker, you're always trying to not obscure and like mess up reality, but it is the closest we can get to actually showing boots on the ground. And that matters because we're not telling people what to think. We're showing them the situation and they're able to come to their own conclusions and we're giving them the context they need to then feel immersed. And so it's about giving people sort of a front seat into this particular experience that they may never ever get to see and it's the emotions on the face it's the candidness it's the surprises that come through the scenes it's it's all those things um it's uh at the end of the day i think like seeing people overcome things or seeing people fail is as humans we relate to that right that's we can hear a statistic and it can kind of roll off us. It may be a shocking one, but it could still roll off us. And if we see the people behind those statistics, the phrases stick with us, their voices stick with us, their backstories, their ongoing stories, it's harder to shake. I, I, I would, I, go ahead, Wayne. No, I would argue there's another element here too. This kind of storytelling really gets beyond stigma. You know, people have preconceptions about addiction and opioid and, you know, it's a moral failing, or if you just tried a little harder or whatever, but, and that's the stigma piece. And I think that's an yeah. obstacle, an obstacle for people getting treatment and just a problem in society in general. But talk about that, because this really does strip away the stigma and show us real people. Yeah, the stigma part was especially important with Recovery Boys, because we're starting with the men where they are. You know, we don't show you their mug shots. We don't give you their rap sheet of all the things that have happened before. We we start with where they are, which is them coming to rehab, which is them making the decision that they want to change their lives. I think that's really important. Um, and the same thing, I made a film called Tutwiler and we made, it was about women in prison. And we made that conscious decision to not put their charges on screen because that's stigmatizing them just to an event in their life in which they're now serving time for. So the same thing goes back to Recovery Boys. We start with where they are and we see them progress or not progress, but we're not stigmatizing their past to then label them as simply an addict, right? Like they are more than that. They're a father, they're a son. And we see that complexity over time. And so it's a, it's a shortcut that a lot of people take when they, they don't mean maybe don't mean to stigmatize but it's a shortcut they take to give people labels right so we understand each other stereotypes stigma all those things and so it's it's essential in the work that you don't do 18 months of work and then undo it all by uh you know labeling someone one way but allowing the audience to see them in all these complex ways yeah I, the word that keeps leaping to my mind as 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 we're having this discussion is empathy and I, I wonder if you're consciously aware of empathy in making these films. Yeah, I probably, I, um, I think I'm brought to the stories I'm brought to because of my own 
empathy I feel, and particularly st telling stories in Appalachia, where I'm from, I, you know, feel very connected to the communities and the individuals that struggle here because there's so little attention around um, the good, right? Like since the war on poverty in the 1960s, most of the coverage of this region has been about our demise, you know, our downfall and uh, pitying us. And so I grew up in this region and I think that that affects the way that I, my empathetic lens, right? So I am, I am more um, empathetic because of being in this region. And I think the stories I tell Kind of like sort of translate that. Um, I, I end up, you know, loving most of the people I film, even if they do bad things, right? Like I still really care about them and, and we have a relationship that's hard to explain. So yeah, it's it's kind of all around. I mean, you have to care about the subjects and you have to care about the participants and all these things in order to spend this much time with people, so. We've had our, our guest, Maddie McGarvey. She's an incredible still photographer on our show twice. And she, she goes into Appalachia a lot with very much the same intent and, and understanding and empathy that you have. Do images have the power still in moving to change minds? I mean, we've, we've hit on that, but go into that a little bit more because I would, I would submit that they do in a way that text, for example, cannot necessarily. Yeah, I think that every medium has the ability to move people if they're caught at the right moment, right? Um, and if they're in the right place. I think text is harder. You have to be in a very quiet place to absorb what is happening. And I've certainly been moved by a lot of texts myself. Still photography captures that one moment, which really can highlight a single moment, whereas cinema allows you to see the time and space and so i think that 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 might be the easiest form medium in terms of its ability to reach people when you can see conflict unfolding when you can see the things that feel true to your own life and so they all have their own ability i think to transform and to increase empathy but i feel like i have a lot of tools in my toolkit as a filmmaker to do that you know there's there's manipulative tools as well like if you think about how music is used in documentary films or if you think about how certain things are cut to make you feel something so it can also be a manipulation but i do think that what's really powerful about cinema and specifically observational cinema is the ability to enter spaces that you wouldn't otherwise enter and um, as long as I, as a filmmaker, can, can take you into those spaces, like a health department meeting where there's a conflict. Um, we've had people, there's a, a health department meeting in Heroin where Jan Rader says there's a debate about whether the community should be releasing and distributing naloxone across the community, which is the opioid reversal drug. And she says, I don't care if I save someone 50 times, that's 50 chances to get a long-term recovery. And for so many people, I can't even tell you how many people have emailed Jan, myself, and others in the film that said that was the line that changed my mind about Narcan. That was the line that I all of a sudden realized the power of naloxone. And so we know that cinema can have change on people's opinions and their um, viewpoints on these particular issues that are hotbed issues in communities. So, Elaine, we know you're working on, you're in production now on a new documentary called King Cole. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. It's a it's a bit of a departure from these previous observational films. I mean, it does have a lot of observation of coal culture. So over the past two years, I've been documenting coal related cultural scenes like um, the Miss Bituminous coal pageant uh, moments where a high school football team, when they leave the locker room, touches a piece of coal as their lucky stone as they go out to play. So it's really about looking at the identity that's been built around the coal industry and coal mining communities. But beyond that observation, it weaves a magical realist tale of a post coal future, because we all know that's where we're going, right? This is this is the the end has been coming for a while for these communities and they've been suffering long enough. And so the film is really about helping Appalachia and other communities like them look forward into what's next. Um, what's our identity in a post coal world? When can we expect to see King Cole, which of course we're looking forward to seeing? It'll be a while, 2023, we're hoping for a release. Um, so yeah, we're still fundraising and shooting and um, because it weaves elements of fiction into nonfiction, it's it's definitely a more ambitious project in, in a certain way. 
You you mentioned editing, and we didn't really get into that, but editing is such a huge part of this, and it's also incredibly time consuming. Uh, you know, we do some editing here, I do some editing on some of my work. It, it's incredibly time consuming, but it is so important. Where, where do you get the patience for it? Or <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe that's what I'm asking. I mean, it's, it's go ahead. We, we got yeah. about a minute left here, Elaine. Editing is about putting your butt in a seat and sitting there. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's, it's about time. Uh, and it takes time and sometimes you get to work with great editors, but taking good field notes and knowing what you want out of a scene it helps as well. And sound editing too, of course, is part of it. And mm -hmm. then I find that even more onerous and it's more just put your butt in a seat and stay, 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 which drives me crazy sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Elaine, in the 30 seconds we have left, how did you get the filmmaker's bug? I just wanted to be a storyteller. I grew up in this region. Um, this region's full of storytellers and it has a strong oral storytelling tradition. And I just love people. And I wanted to be out in the world telling stories. I didn't know it was going to be film. And I'm happy to be here where I am. Well, we're thrilled that you're making films. They are a remarkable body of work. And if folks want to know more, what's your website? It's Elaine McMillian Sheldon dot com. M C Million Sheldon dot com. Super. Well, uh, thank you so much for being with us. She is Elaine McMillian Sheldon. You want to check out her films. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>